Hey guys, this is Claudia of the Alexandrite System. So far on System System, we've almost exclusively talked about visual artists, but today I want to talk about a musician, Left at London. It's coming, don't talk to myself, but it was in my own voice that told me. Singer songwriter, comedian, and former Vine star Nat Puff, aka Left at London, has been producing music since 2014, but gained major recognition with her hit single Revolution Lover in 2018. In April of this year, she came out as an OSDB system on Twitter by talking about how her newest single, Six Feet, was literally about her experiences with OSDB. Recently, we got to sit down with Left at London to discuss her music and her experiences of being a system. So welcome to another installment of System System. So would you like to start by introducing yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Left at London. I am a musician, comedian, a poet, whatever, and <laughs> I just released a EP. Transgender Street Legend Volume 2. I'm working on music with my band, Wow OK. I have OSDD 1B. And uh... let's start by um, talking about uh, Six Feet and I guess um, your process of uh, system discovery. That's a really interesting sort of thing because I didn't know that I had OSDD back when I wrote that song. Um, so essentially my my story for all that is just like I I discovered that I was like I started experiencing symptoms in 2017 like mid to late 2017 and essentially I had this persecutor that would like show up here and there at very inopportune times and um didn't know what it was, assumed that it was like a delusion or something like that. I was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar at different points of my life. And then uh, he didn't show up for a bit. And then a year passed and he showed up again. And I thought that I essentially like medicated and therapized him out of my life. And which was obviously incorrect. And somebody that was in my life was like um have you tried talking to him on purpose and i was like no and so i i ended up getting to talk to him and he ended up getting to talk to this person and like it took a little bit but like he seems to have chilled out and uh that's that's yeah that's great so the the story in six feet is is that based on like a real thing that happened with with this persecutor uh so the first time that i met him he <clears throat> i i was the pizza delivery driver and uh i was literally just like you know talking to myself and then halfway through he was like my name is uh and then he said his name uh then he started explaining like who he was and I was like what the fuck this is not anything that I'm used to I am trying to drive and there is uh there is like like he described himself as a demon at first so I was like oh shit okay um yeah so I was just convinced that I was like about to like die in a car crash that he was about to do and I was freaking out not knowing what um what was going to happen and this was like on the job i had to uh i had to like the moment that i came back from that delivery i was like hey i'm having like some freakishly bad brain problems right now i need to i need i need to step out and uh luckily management understood and just was like take a breather and uh luckily it was not a busy night that night either way that's sort of like the origin of of that as you said, you started experiencing symptoms in 2017, um, but I read, I believe on your Twitter, that you didn't really come to terms with it until last year? Yeah, um, late 2019. Uh, October 1st, actually, was the uh, was what we consider uh, that alter's birthday to be, because that's when uh, 
uh, he sort of like was able to talk and in in like a non hostile way, and like we were able to like converse, and that was sort of like the catalyst for becoming much better like relationship with that altar specifically. What was it like coming to terms with with your own plurality? Um, there was a lot, and in some cases, like because that I'm rather new to being a part of a system, there's, like, also a sense of, like, I'm still coming to terms with it, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I'm still, like, trying to, like, understand what that means for myself. I guess that I'd say um, coming to terms with my plurality was definitely something that didn't come easy, and it still doesn't come easy, but it's getting easier every day, you know, just trying to understand that, like, no matter what you think the trauma that could have caused this is, no matter if you don't know what the trauma that caused this is, no matter what, like, like, uh, no matter what way your alters sort of, like, show up and, like, talk to you or talk to others or how, like, stuff like that, like, all these things. It took me a while to understand that every system is different, and especially with an OSDD system, it's going to be different than a DID system, and... That, that was, like, a lot of the stuff that got me not understanding uh, that I, like, like not fully processing that I was a system at that time, um, or that I was part of a system at that time. You mentioned having to deal with or understand uh, the fact that, you know, OSDD has some significant differences to DID. Uh, do you want to elaborate about that more? Well, admittedly, I don't know all of the differences between OSDD and DID. I feel like there are a lot more experienced people who can sort of explain those differences. But for me, the difference between, like, the differences that I was sort of getting between OSDD and DID were, um, for example, in my system, like, I have just sort of, like, a generally bad memory, but I don't, like, black out out when somebody else is fronting usually like it's fuzzy but i'm not completely blacked out uh that's one thing that sort of happened with me uh that was sort of like leading me to like come to terms with the differences if that makes sense it's definitely because osdd is so like so much less represented in the broader system community and also in just like the the psych field in general i feel like you know one osdd system to another here it's so hard to except that what's happening to you is a very similar thing to DID. Are your switches like the, uh, people with DID often, um, explain it as, like, switching places with a person. Like, you step back and they step forward. But my experience and the experience of, um, a few other OSDD systems I know has been more like becoming a different person. Do you empathize with that? It's almost like both for, mm-hmm. for for me personally. Like, there's like, okay, this is going to be a really weird uh, thing to reference, but I was watching The Muppets a couple days ago. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, just like, uh, like The Muppet Show, like the original 1970s Muppet Show, and one of their guests was this, uh, I believe, Norwegian, like, theater group called The Mummenshans. Uh, I'm not sure if you or anybody is familiar with The Mummenshans these days, but... Uh, but pretty much they had this, like, they're this, like, silent theater group. And they did this one bit where they both had these clay faces. Uh, they had, like, these cl- masks masks made of undried clay. And they were just sort of, like, like looking at each other. And one of them is just, like, like adjusting their face to look, like, uh, to look more, like, beautiful or something like that. And the other one is, like trying to do that at the same time and like it's like not working for them but it's working for the other person uh and eventually they're like having like this like like physical fight and like while trying to take a swing at each other they like fall and they like land in each other's faces until their like clay faces are like melded but they're still like their individual faces but they're also like trying to like tear like tear each other apart and there's like strings of clay like going between them this is a really weird metaphor to use no, but uh i, I just watched this episode <laughs> it's like i just watched this episode and so it's like still fresh on the mind but i feel like uh it's just sort of similar to that where it's like all right we're separate but there's also sort of like this like blurriness between the two where 
it's it, there, there's there's a separation but there's not a complete separation so the other song on transgender street legend volume two uh that is explicitly about ostd um my friends are kind of strange in another interview i couldn't find the exact quote because i looked for that interview and uh, the domain has expired but um Ooh. The, yeah, uh, it was something along the lines of you wanted to make a more uh, positive song about your system uh, compared to Six Feet. Do you want to talk about that a little more? The song Friends Are Kind of Strange was really interesting to make because, so I'm going to start with sort of like talking about like the musical component of it and then the lyrical component of it and then sort of like how the lyrical component sort of evolved over time. Musically, the the intro, you'll hear like this background like auto-tuned choir uh that's just like me layered over myself three times uh it's just like that whole section in the background during chuck's uh first section um that was originally used in a william crook song called semi-automatic uh he ended up cutting it out because he was like doesn't match the song as much as i would like it to keep the loop if you want to fuck with it then by all means go ahead so i kept the loop so i gave the loop to chuck and he did this really interesting thing where uh like during like the part where uh where he starts singing like familiar that whole section in the background you can hear like uh like like that whole section that is my first vocal the um like the choir chopped up and everything and then immediately after that he started like playing this like like piano thing where it's like and it barely had the sample the original sample in it anymore and i was like this is this is the vibe this is the vibe this is the vibe god damn it and so while trying to come up with a chorus i came up with a line my friends are kind of strange and the way that i originally interpreted that was just sort of like like i feel like like in the best of ways uh like me as a trans person my transness is seen as the weirdest part about me when in reality i'm just sort of a weird person altogether and that's kind of like sort of the truth with a lot of my trans friends so that's what i was writing about at first and then as like halfway through the chorus i was like but this also applies to like how people view my alters so i can write about them too at the same time so i started writing about sort of like this combination my transness and my experience with plurality as just sort of like a combination and so like once that was established it was a lot easier to write like every other part chuck went full on with the plurality uh, when he was writing like his section because the entire like first minute of the song right until my chorus is all written by chuck like the instrumental and the main vocal uh like except for that choir in the background everything in that intro is chuck and he did a fantastic job uh because at one point like in a later part of the song i was trying to get approval for a specific line from uh one of my alters and i literally closed my eyes and i was just like hey you cool with this and i heard him in the back just being like yeah that's chill so like i went back to chuck and he was like like <laughs> he, like he had never experienced anybody with plurality before so uh he was like oh that's kind of cool. And so he wrote that down. Like, sometimes I close my eyes to talk to you. Uh, that was the first line. And that's like where he got that from. After that, I sort of explained a little bit about my experience, uh, sort of in the way that we are with plurality and discovering it and whatnot. And that's when he wrote like the whole like familiar section where it's like, have we ever met before? Then the rest of it lyrically was uh, written by me. I think my favorite part in that song, like the section with the amen break, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with an amen break, like not, as like a musical yet. term. Okay, so it's pretty much whenever like, so there's like drum breaks where it's like, if you speed that up a lot, it's called like an amen break because that like, there was this one song that had an amen in the title. I can't remember the original title. But uh, there's a drum break in that that was sampled in a lot of, like, techno house drum and bass songs uh, from, like, the 90s, essentially. And so it just, like, doing that got referred to as an amen break. 
And, uh, and I could be completely off here. So if anybody wants to correct me, feel free to correct me. But like that whole section with that Amen break lyrically, and also like the guitar line in that, that section that like right before the lyrics come in, it's just so good. I'm so glad that I came up with that. No makeup on my arms, no shame in feeling crazy. Nobody's life makes perfect to everyone. That first line, the first line, no makeup on my arms was actually written by an altar and I believe that's what we were like talking about when I was trying to when when Chuck saw me close my eyes, that line just like kept on like like he kept on suggesting it to me to the point where I was like, Oh, oh, this is an altar suggesting something to me. I was not picking up on that at first. <laughs> uh so I added that line in and then the song just sort of like became like immediately more like, intense and in like a really like positive way and it's really interesting because that although the song was originally intended lyrically to be about like trans people and plurality over time i sort of started only seeing it as a plural song uh and what's interesting is that i've started now interpreting the song i started i started interpreting my own song as a completely different meaning as the original uh, which I feel like is very rare, but when it happens, it's such a beautiful feeling. But pretty much, I started interpreting it as Chuck being, like, the host, and then, like, me sort of, like, being this character of, like, like, un- like the first altar that the host meets, and then just being like, hey, we got a lot of other people back here. <laughs> that was sort of, like, my experience, so... Like, the fact that we made this song that kind of completely, like, only semi-intentionally meant to reflect that, and then ended up, like, completely reflecting that, was really interesting to me. So I, I have a really, I have a really deep connection with that song. Uh, and I'm and I'm really glad that people are, like, peep, like even, like, non-plural peeps that I know are just, like, kind of loving that song. And it's really cool to see, like, a song that is, like, explicitly uh explicitly plural and and somewhat explicitly trans uh to be like acknowledged by people that wouldn't be involved in that like are not normally involved in either or one particular of those communities so i'm really grateful for that i think that um you know with regards to to singlets vibing with the song i think that singlets understand plurality more than they think that they do but when you use, like, the community words, all of it just kind of, like, shuts down with them. I'm interested in that uh, sort of, like, concept that, like, like understanding plurality more than they think they do. Like, I'm not doubting you, but I'm curious to know, like, what your evidence and, like, how you came to that conclusion. It's a few different things. One thing is, you know, maybe it's just, just me reading too much into things, but there's so many stories in media that involve two people living in the same body or two it's it's usually two but um multiple people living in the same body or living the same life where i'm sure that a decent amount of the people who wrote those are plural but i feel like not all of them can be and certainly not everyone who reads it and interprets it and you know understands the dynamic between those two characters and how they they balance that life certainly not all those people are systems as well um the other thing is just in my own personal experiences we're married right now and we you know obviously we date people uh before we we found out about our own system and i found that people that we dated understood how to interact with our littles when they were out without either of us knowing that's what they were doing. So I have this, this, uh, this ex who at the time one of our, one of our littles spent quite a bit of time with her. This little is, uh, pretty afraid of the dark. And so this ex, uh, she came up with this anti-monster spell for, for them, for me, for them. And I think that just the ability to approach that in a, in a childlike way when it's like, you know, my 19-year-old quote-unquote boyfriend or whatever is, is talking about how he's afraid of the dark and is like being a little bit like childlike, I, I think that singlets get it more when they don't get it. Yeah, it's like when you point it out, then all of a sudden it gets more complicated for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 
Mm, yeah, that's that's completely like that's completely understood. Like, it's also kind of weird because that like I did not consider like that I had a dissociative disorder for like two years, like since starting exhibiting symptoms. And the weird thing about that is that like I was watching Golden Girls like a a couple of a couple of weeks ago and the season two finale i don't know what it is about season finales today but we're we're just talking about them there was this episode called emptiness and it's and it's meant to set up this sitcom like essentially was them trying to make a spin-off show Mm -hmm. uh called empty nest uh that started like that started like two different characters and one of the supporting characters was a was a system that had three altars and like i remember watching that i remember watching like other like different sort of like medias with quote multiple personality syndrome and stuff like oh no multiple personality disorder and stuff like that and still not like having a click that that like could have been what it was like when i was experiencing similar things and I don't know what it was that sort of like kept me from kind of making that connection until somebody else made that connection. Cause I was not the first one to make that connection. A therapist was not the first person to make that connection. It was somebody else entirely. The fact that the symptoms could be noticed without the actual thing that it was being even acknowledged was just so weird because of like, I watched that episode with the character that is a system and just being like, well, like, this isn't, like, a harmful, like, representation of, of, like, this person. Like, they seem to be well-adjusted. They seem to have a pretty healthy system, and they're not murdering anybody, so that's kind of a first, especially for a show in the 80s. I was pretty shocked to see that, like, it wasn't necessarily the most positive representation, as is, is, as is expected, but it wasn't, like, something that would make me, like, ashamed to like understand that that was like a part of me is there like it was like literally right in front of my nose like this whole time and yet i i did not discover it until two years later it's just like mind-blowing to me like even today it's always so strange isn't it i had uh, a very similar experience not only with with our own system but with being trans where it was like i knew that trans people existed i knew that you know people transitioned but that wasn't something that that i could do obviously you know yeah and even if i wanted to do it that's not what this is right yeah you know like stuff like that oh god and then like the day that it clicks is always just like somehow it's not relieving when it clicks like for some reason when it clicked for me both my transness and my being part of a system i was just like filled with dread just like christ another thing Thing. Yes. You know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I I said that in in our video with the ring system about like accepting our system. I didn't want another thing because, you know, I'm already gay, I'm already trans. I've already got, you know, I'm sorry for yelling by the way. Um <laughs> oh, I I can just like the the good thing about having a conversation over the internet is I can just turn you down if you're too loud. <laughs> but yeah, I I very much I don't want another thing, but yet, you know, I guess you already have the thing. Yeah, thing here. Uh, going back to talking about uh, being trans and being a system, you know, one trans woman with OSDD to another, do you feel there is an inherent connection between being trans and being a system? Debated it a couple times. There's a part of me that's, like, accepting of that sort of, like, mindset, but another part of me that's, like, skeptical of that mindset and, like, the reason why, and this is a rather new development. Um, so, as a trans woman, and this is uh, this is going into discourse territory here. So, uh, brace yourselves. So, I will occasionally say the F slur. I believe that I can reclaim it as a trans woman because that a lot of people have referred to me as that, regardless, and that is because that I am a trans woman i specifically experience womanness and transness at the same time one of my alters is also a woman and just not feel comfortable reclaiming that and i'm like 
is this altar sis what like like that shouldn't make sense but it kind of does but it kind of doesn't and like it's just this kind of like strange thing where i'm like i completely understand sort of like the um the connection that one would make uh because i've made it myself but another part of me that's like there it, it's it's like the moment shots thing where it's like it's it's like separate but it's like also like together and they're like trying to like pull apart but you can see space between them but they're also like together if that makes sense it's mm-hmm. it's a really complex thing and i feel like i am like like my brain is like fried from from that like conversation to add anything of value to it <laughs> it is so strange having people in in a system, you know, a trans body who consider themselves to be cis, but not cis in terms of, you know, the body's assigned gender at birth. It's very, it's very strange. Like, I, I have one alter who goes by he, him pronouns, but he, like, doesn't like to think about gender, not because that he's, like, trans, but he, but because that he specifically is, like, it really doesn't matter to me because that the body that I'm in is, like, a trans body and like because that sort of he associates like like his definition of trans is like very much like how the mind correlates to the body mm-hmm. and because that like not even the mind correlates with the body in his case uh he's just sort of like i don't care i really don't care and like so he goes by he him pronouns but when anybody asks him like so like are you a guy he's like it literally doesn't matter, <laughs> like, <laughs> which I which I find kind of interesting because like he doesn't give any other indication that he's non-binary. He just literally just doesn't like thinking about his gender in relation to like the body that like he sort of inhabits and um, versus like the body that he has in Headspace. Mm-hmm. And so he's just so he's just like pretty much like I don't care. And that's always really interesting to me. It's just so weird. I like, like how this interview can literally just be us just, like, describing things that happen in our daily lives. And this, but like, that's weird, isn't it? And then we can literally just do that for an entire interview. <laughs> we can just be like, like, that's so cool. And it's all so weird. Life is so cool and weird. And it's just, we can just keep on going like this. It's great. <laughs> Here's an odd question. And it's, it's one I've been thinking about for, for a bit leading up to this interview. Um, you're the only person that I've ever interviewed that has done, like, other interviews before, as far as I know, and who has done, like, yeah. I guess the interview circuit in, like, releasing something, right? Um, yeah. You know, I've I've read several of your interviews up to this. I, I imagine that the similar types of questions that you get, like, talking about your work and stuff, I, I imagine that gets kind of boring or tedious in a way, and I was wondering... What do you wish someone would ask you about your work? Hmm, what's what's something that I wish that somebody would ask me about my work? That is, that's one of the questions. I <laughs> like weirdly enough, I feel like people don't like ask me enough like what I want to talk about uh, in interviews. It's always sort of like how they want their own stuff to go. Um, one of my favorite interviews that I ever done uh, was with the Michigan Gailey. That was because that I was asked questions I had never been asked before, and I never even thought were possible to ask in an interview before. <laughs> like it, it, it felt more like a conversation than it did like, like it felt more like a casual conversation than it did an interview. And I think that's like the uh, that's sort of like what I aspire to in all interviews that I'm a part of. That's how I know it's a good interview when it just feels like it's a conversation and like it, I can, when I can feel like I can hit up the person afterwards again. Like, or they can hit me up without it being, like, strange. That's how I know it's a good interview. And, like, like I, I feel that for, like, pretty much all the small publications that I've been involved with. That's no side-eyeing, like, anything that, um, at, like, any publication that is, like, larger that has interviewed me. That's just literally just sort of what happens. Just because that, like, the smaller interviewers tend to already know the questions that larger interviewers ask. Uh, I feel like, I feel like the ideal questions that I would be asked would be about just like, like, I don't know. I feel like my hobbies, like, like, like my interests are like, uh, like golden girls and the Muppet show. And I've already gotten to talk about them both today. It's been a, it's been a good interview is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) 
Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, then here's my here's my uh, off the beaten path question. Who is your favorite Muppet? My favorite Muppet? Yeah. Shit. I gotta come up with a favorite Muppet. So I'm just gonna list off some Muppets that I appreciate specifically. In terms of like the main Muppet cast, I feel like my favorite has got to be Fozzie or Ralph. Uh, like those are like my those are like my favorite like main players, but my favorite like side characters, Wayne and Wanda for one, great combo. So Wayne and Wanda are like in the first couple of seasons uh, and in the Muppet movie, like for a brief amount of time, they are like the like. Like, so every time Sam the Eagle introduces them as, like, real art. And, like, Wanda always has, like, You do something to me. Like, she has that sort of voice. And then Wayne has, like, this, like, I could have danced all night. Like, it's very, like, it's very, like, hammy and very, like, like, um, I just love the vibe. I just love the vibe. (laughs) They always sing these jazz standards. And, like, for example, they sang Under a Paper Moon. And while he's singing it, the moon just, like, falls right on him. Like, something happens, like, within, like, the first, like, ten seconds of, of, of the sketch. So, like, the song doesn't even finish. And it's always, like, such a good bit to just be like, yes, this is real art. This is real, like, no tomfoolery unlike the rest of the show. And then, like, they start doing something serious and it's just building up to a punchline that's based around the song. I've always really liked that. Uh, when are Wayne and Wanda going to be uh, featured on the uh, Left at London album? <laughs> Get a Wayne and Wanda feature. I gotta. So you came out publicly as a system, um, obviously, or we probably wouldn't be doing this interview. Um, <laughs> as as far as I know, the first like really public mention of it was uh, on Twitter, talking about um, Six Feet and how it is very literally about OSDD. What went into uh, making the decision to be public about that? Because you have a rather large audience, and I can imagine that's probably somewhat intimidating. It was, and it still is. Um, Like, I have a couple of, like, drafts in my tweets that are, like, specifically about being a system that I'm just, like... I don't know if I want to publish these yet. I I will I will give you one of them, just to give you an idea of some of these tweets. uh, (laughs) Which is just, like, like, um, like, in between asterisks... New York altar voice, end of asterisks, quote, Hey, I'm frontin' here! <laughs> it's... it's it, <laughs> That's but, exactly my jam. Yeah, it's... it's it, These are the types of tweets that I have, like, hidden away in the drafts, but um, pretty much, like, the reason that I had came out on Twitter was actually because that I came out on Instagram about, like, two months prior, but it wasn't on my... It wasn't on my Instagram account. Like, essentially what had happened was I did this interview for Faces of Fortitude. They take a photograph, they take photographs of you while you are talking about your experiences with mental health. Often people talk about, like, like suicide attempts and, like, serious shit like that. And so I was starting to describe uh, the second time that I ever saw this, uh, this former persecutor alter and he came out and finished the interview and i was like well i wasn't intending on coming out as a system but clearly he wants me to so now i got a debate with myself on whether or not i actually want this interview to be released and it took like several months but i was finally like okay let the interview go and none of my audience crossed over with the faces of fortitude audience it seemed so like nobody knew at first Uh, And I didn't share it with, like, anybody until I was like, "Uh, I should probably let my audience know at this point. I should probably share that interview because I didn't share the interview initially uh, because I was scared to. And um, so finally I posted about it on Twitter. I was like, well, it's time, I guess. And so it was time. That's why I did it. How did it feel, like, letting that go? I was surprised to have so many um, systems already have been supporting me. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of them were like, what? 
holy shit, you're a system too? And I'm like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I, th- there, <laughs> like, I was like, I was like freaking out. Like, there's this many of us? Like, and so like the fact that people felt like represented was like a huge, was a huge get. And it's really, uh, it's really funny because about like a week or so afterwards, some right wing pundit quote tweeted one of my videos that had nothing to do with it and nothing to do with like me being a system or anything like that and in that video i sing in my deep register and talk in my in in this register mm-hmm. and communism kills if you're familiar with no. communism kills. They're still <laughs> referred... well not anymore i okay, tried okay. to find this com i tried to find this comment but their account got suspended but <laughs> um <laughs> so like uh but uh pretty much <laughs> so pretty much they were like like this person has two different voices uh kind of reminds me of Sybil and they had no idea wow. they had no idea and so <laughs> I was really tempted to quote tweet it you don't know the half of it babe but I didn't thank god I didn't but oh my god the fact that Somebody referred to me as Sybil, completely out of context of my actual dissociative disorder, is so fucking funny to me. Ugh. Goddamn. It's buckwild. It's absolutely (laughs) buckwild. So, uh, communism kills if you're watching this. You got it right on the money, babe. (laughs) This is sort of three questions in one that I'm going to ask, I guess. Um, so... Now and or in the past, has uh, anyone besides you directly contributed to your music? Uh, uh, in your system, pardon, not not like outside of no, yeah. your body. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, I've collaborated with several people before, but uh, no, I, uh, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the line, No Makeup on My Arms, was written by an altar um, from the song My Friends Are Kind of Strange. When I was in high school... My songwriting style was a lot different back then, and there, uh, there's a possibility. We we've discussed this. With the, the 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 memories are hazy because it was high school and it was pre-transition, and we don't like to think about that stuff. But uh, <laughs> but pretty much, we have a theory that it was likely somebody else that wrote a lot of the lyrics that I was trying to write in high school, uh, because of just how differently they are from each other like i feel like i write a lot of pop stuff nowadays and back then i was writing a lot of like esoteric folk clearly like my style has changed over the years but um like i'm about to uh re-release a bunch of these demos that i um did in high school like on Bandcamp, just to like just to like celebrate Bandcamp friday and stuff like that and and i'm pretty sure that people will be able to hear it like yeah these are definitely different songs these feel like they were written by a different person and uh that that's like the biggest extent that i really know of but that also just might have been like caused by like the fact that like my personality and my my sense of self changed drastically after transition so we don't really 100 percent know but that is a possibility in the future do you see yourself collaborating with your system more on your work that's a question that I'd have to ask them, to be honest. Like, because um, one of them has written a poem before, like like a really good poem too that like came out of nowhere, and uh, it was about plurality and his experience as an altar. Like, I know that at least one of them has sort of like an artistic mind. I'd I'd always be interested in hearing what others have to say about my music. I actually, mm, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna ask if I can share that poem because it's a good poem and I really want him to share it. Okay. Um, or, or me to share it, but on his behalf. Um, let me see. He gave an immediate no. <laughs> That's so bad. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are like moments of my life where I'm like, damn. Obviously, I'm faking this because I am just like. You know, like, you know, just like doing things that I would want to do. And then meanwhile, stuff like this happens. And I'm like, well, fuck. It's always it's always really funny when when shit works out like that, where it's like I'm faking it. And somebody's like, you're not. And I'm like, shut up. 
back when I was like really really struggling with that um, I made this this like thread on Twitter that was that was like am I am I faking this like you know is this is this all in my head and then I just found myself typing a response to this thread that said girl we're real and I was like okay I guess so yeah <laughs> It's really how it happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so my last two questions are the ones I ask everyone who comes on System System. The first one is, if you could vanish any one piece of uh, system-related media, what would it be and why? Ooh. There was a really evil part of me that wanted to jokingly answer your channel, but... Uh, <laughs> Hot take. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Uh, oh, God. I am not too familiar with, like, system media because I specifically avoid it. I'm pretty sure that, like, everybody here has mentioned Split. I'm pretty sure that's, like, the first thing that people go to. It's but, uh, um, four out of six at this point. Four out of six. Yeah. Um, that makes me want to be unique. I want to be the one that mentions something completely off the walls. Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. That one Trisha Paytas video. Okay. That's 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 the thing. That's the thing I'd get rid of. At least with Jekyll and Hyde, that wasn't intended to be like explicitly about systems. Trisha Paytas was like actively like knowing that she was spreading misinformation and still spreading it, which is just like fucked. It's fucked. I've heard that that the reason that she does these things, or I've heard it theorized. I don't know if she's officially diagnosed with BPD, but I. I know that uh, you've mentioned that you have BPD as well, and that was originally one of my questions, but I completely forgot to write it down. Um, but... <laughs> you can, well, we can talk about it now. Yeah, um, what, is, what is your experience living with, with both BPD and OSDD? Because I know a lot of um, systems are initially misdiagnosed with BPD. My BPD ten like the things that sort of were like indicators of me having BPD were completely different than the indicators that I had OSDD. Mm -hmm. So there actually wasn't that much overlap or confusion between the two. It was just like, oh, you're reacting very strangely to things because of your BPD. And then you end up like turning into literally other people because of the OSDD, it was just like a very like easy split to make where it was like, okay, this is the BPD, this is the OSDD. Whereas like, I felt like my diagnosis was pretty like cut and dry. So my experience with BPD tended to affect my social life, whereas my, whereas my OSDD sort of affected my um, just general personal life, I felt like. Like my alters prior to coming out rarely came out while somebody else was present if that makes sense like it was all happening like very like personally and i was very confused and very scared about both things my former psych wasn't the one who diagnosed me with osdd but she was the one to diagnose me with bpd so there definitely could have been like a oh yeah you're also experiencing these osdd symptoms obviously you're bpd <laughs> i definitely have like have experienced symptoms of both. It's, I'm at a point in my life now where it's mostly under control, uh, my BPD, because like medications and therapy and all that sort of stuff. But it's like obvious what is and what isn't part of the OSDD at this point of my life. My last question is, uh, do you have anything to say to other systems out there? If the evidence for you being a system uh, vastly outweighs uh, the evidence against you being a system as it normally does uh then you're probably a system and you're probably still a system that's pretty much my like thing that i need to tell myself because literally all my evidence against it is just based on like me just saying like repeatedly like mm, but are you really though like it that's not a fact that's that's not even based in like that's not rooted in any reality so I have to like keep on reminding myself of that. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much for sitting down with me. Uh, where can people find you online? 
leftinlondon.com will have literally all the social medias that you can find of mine. Except for Patreon. I should update that. Yeah, I need to update that. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell my web designer soon. <laughs> but I, I, uh, you can find me on leftinlondon.com and Patreons completely separately. <laughs> Well, thank you once again for for being here. Uh, this was this was fun. This might be my favorite interview that I've done. Oh yeah, I'm glad. I'm I'm glad to hear it. What are you uh, doing? <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm looking at my cat. The cat is licking his uh his like scratch post. Just like straight up licking it, not scratching it, just licking it. Stop doing that. Our cat will lick the couch a lot. I think cats just cats just like licking. Them. Cats love licking. Thanks again to Left and London for sitting down with us, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.